I think you could call this, this would be good for just plastic. It's got dermal component. The junction goes beyond the dermal component. So we've got kind of shouldering. The nests have bridging between uh, reedy. We've got some fibroplasia underneath. Of course, none of those individual things by themselves are specific for dysplastic nevus, which is part of the whole reason there's controversy over it for decades, because you can see some of those things in congenital pattern nevi and other nevus. But I think that plus cytologic atypia, and I think there's arguably obvious atypia here to my eye, at least, I guess it's in the eye of the beholder, but there are cells that are larger than like kind of the, the basal layer or mid-level um, spinous uh, keratinocyte nuclei, um, you know, some some people have used criteria about like one using multiple times of the size of those as a way to judge how much atypia there is. But a lot of times I think in practice, many uh, dermatopathologists use kind of a gestalt. Um, so whether that's right or not, that's that's I think uh, the reality. And um, which is why these are challenging and somewhat subjective. But I, I think this is fine for moderate atypia. Although I would point out the caveat that the more recent WHO edition has uh, encouraged us to use a low grade, high grade, two tier system rather than three tier. But I still personally, and maybe I'll get roasted for this, but I still use three tier grading in my practice just because the dermatologists that I've, I work with and have worked with uh, are used to that. And so I think that it takes time to shift to a new system. And before making a shift, you got to really make sure that all of your treating physician colleagues understand understand that are on board. So um, I do think though that I like the idea of two-tier uh, grading system. I do recognize there is some subjectivity in uh, the in any grading system. And I do think that grading, um, it's hard to prove that grading necessarily matters or predicts what these lesions will do. And, and for anyone watching this online, that there's it's way more complicated than we can get into. But the basic idea is that dysplastic nevi people with the syndrome that have uh, the familial melanoma syndrome get a lot of these atypical looking nevi with the, these sorts of microscopic features. And those patients have increased risk of melanoma. So a long time ago, people began to realize that you can see similar pattern of nevus in patients that don't have that syndrome. And so these were also called dysplastic nevi. And uh, the concept uh, has been challenged by others by saying, well, this is not really dysplasia. These tumors are not, these are not pre-malignants. They're not going to progress in a stepwise fashion of malignancy like we would think of in say squamous dysplasia. So I, and I personally, uh, in general, agree with that. Can, they, can a dysplastic nevus turn into melanoma? Sure it can, but so can a congenital pattern nevus or any nevus for that matter. Um, and I, in my personal practice, I, I feel like the most common times I see nevus come from, I mean, melanoma arise from a nevus is from just conventional nevus or congenital pattern, regular nevi more than dysplastic nevi. <clears throat> but I guess it may be in the eye of the beholder. So, uh, yeah, I would call this uh, moderate, and there has been some growing evidence. I think most of the derms I've worked with over my career have, have re-excised uh, moderate dysplastic nevi if they go to a, a visible margin, um, and uh, th there has been uh, some uh, more recently published literature suggesting that that's not necessarily required. Um, so it's a, a, some people have different views about this. So basically everything I've said, I'm sure there's someone watching this video who will disagree with something I've said. You are not alone. Everyone's been disagreeing about this since uh, around the time that I was born. And it's probably not gonna be resolved anytime soon. It's a area of great contention. I would say if you happen to be a patient watching this, recognize that dysplastic nevus is basically a, in general, these are benign nevi that are atypical or weird looking microscopically sometimes because of depending on the degree of weirdness and and unusualness uh, your dermatologist may want to remove the lesion and again there is debate over that and and you can just you can talk about it with your dermatologist but please know that most of these lesions do not progress to melanoma okay that again talk about all this with your dermatologist but I do see patients sometimes that watch these videos and also patients that have been told by people who don't really understand the situation um, oftentimes by, by non-dermatologists who may be less familiar with the complexity of this, that this is dysplasia. So it's it's a pre-malignant lesion. And that I, I think is uh, uh, not, not an accurate statement in general as a broad thing to say that a dysplastic nevus is a pre-malignant lesion, I don't think is, is, is uh, accurate in general. Some of them could potentially turn to melanoma, but that's true of any, any nevus. Uh, and we can just, it's not feasible to remove every nevus from someone. So there you go, there's your philosophy for the day and feel free to roast me in the comments below. I can, I can take it, I think. But yeah, to me, I, I think this would be fine to call a moderate uh, dysplastic.
I do think once we're in the severe category, it's a good idea to make sure they're removed because, you know, we it, it, at that range, we start to have overlapping features with melanoma and, you know, we're only human and melanocytic lesions are hard. And so sometimes lesions that look like severe dysplastic nevus, uh, melanoma can mimic those. And so probably to be on the safe side, removal is, is a good idea to be safe. Moderate, I think it's still uh, uh, up in the air and, and an evolving area.